think this is on. Is this on? Yes, okay. you are. Cool. All right. So um, I'm uh, Catherine Tyler, and we're doing a panel discussion. And as you can see, there's like nearly as many people on the stage as there are in the audience. So woohoo! Thank you for hanging in there till the end of um, SAM. We're going to be talking about uh, sort of the chronobiology of uh, shift work and uh, emergency medicine in general. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to pop up and introduce themselves. Just maybe from starting with Ali. Yeah. And Ali Alvarez, I'm the uh, Wellness uh, Community Chair uh, and Director of Wellbeing at Stanford. I'm Amanda Deutsch. I'm the current Wellness Fellow at Stanford. Hi, I'm Ash Stevenson. I'm a fourth year medical student at Stanford. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Simeo Lisa Auerwein. I'm one of the associate program directors at Ohio State, and I am the current CORD Wellbeing Committee Chair. I am Amanda Ritchie. I'm a second year EMIM resident at LSU in New Orleans. My name is Meng Cao. I'm one of the faculty at UT Southwestern, and I'm one of the co-chairs for our faculty wellness committee. I'm Corey Poffenberger, and I am the Vice Chair for Wellbeing at the University of New Mexico. Uh, we don't have any financial disclosures, but I would like some. So if anybody, <laughs> anybody has any available, please let me know. Nobody else have, has any financial disclosures either. So we're just going to spend a couple of minutes with a sort of a brief overview of what chronobiology and emergency medicine looks like. Then we're going to talk about some specific physiologic events that commonly happen in the workplace. Then we're going to talk about what some systems-based responses might be, um, and that will vary from uh, individual department to individual department, and the concept of shared responsibility and fatigue management. So chronobiology is the study of uh, time-based processes within uh, biology. And it is somewhat amazing to me that we think that, uh, you know, in emergency medicine, we often think that we are sort of immune to uh, some of the biological processes that affect every single organism and indeed most cells. So, you know, one of the things that happened uh, in the Industrial Revolution, hands up anybody who knows when we first got widespread lighting. So, 1790 in England, when they first had gas lights, right? And then Baltimore was the first um, city in the United States <laughs> to get uh, widespread uh, lighting with gas. You can't say gas lighting anymore because it has a whole different, <laughs> has a whole different meaning. Um, but, and then, you know, Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulb, you know, about 80 years after that. So really only for the best part of 250 years have we actually had the ability to work at nighttime. So it's a very, very recent process and, you know, in terms of human lifespan and in terms of how we've processed our lives um, around it. So I'm going to just sort of focus very briefly on um, some of the chronobiology that affects people um, and with a little bit of a reference to what our chronotypes are. Hands up anybody in the room who knows what your chronotype refers to. Woohoo! All right, yay. Um, so some of this documentation actually comes from the Federal A Aviation Authority, um, and they have this uh, great advisory which says this very profound statement that sleep is the only way to reverse sleepiness. And we have all kinds of tricks. My husband, also an emergency physician, likes to say a shower's worth at least an hour's worth of sleep, which sort of is true. We're all f familiar with caffeine. Who experienced some sleeplessness coming from either coast to Texas or some disrupted sleep? Right, you know, like wide awake at two in the morning. <clears throat> so uh, this uh, slide comes from a study that was republished in uh, Vox, and this is actually just looking at a, a population of about uh, 55,000 United States uh, residents, and this shows the, the time spread of a typical chronotype. And the chronotype is defined as the mid-sleep time period of when you would ideally go to bed and then wake up. So you can see that the mid-sleep for most people is going to be around 3 or 4 o'clock, and there are some uh, sex differences, um, but it's a pretty much normal distribution. 
This next slide actually comes from the um, same study. And one of the, I found this very, very, it, when I first saw this, I was like, oh, this is why I can't do night shifts anymore. Because I actually used to have a very late chronotype when I was in my 20s or early 30s. Like swing shifts were the best, night shifts were no problem. And all of a sudden I got to sort of 40, 45, 50, 55, and night shifts became a huge burden. And the reason was, and you can see there's probably like a little dash of little dots on either side of those bars, you can see that actually there is a huge natural variation in when people's chronotype is, but also that it tends to get earlier with time. So most people, not everybody, but most people will find that their latest chronotype is when they're in their late teenage, early 20s, maybe even to your late 20s, but that it gets earlier, especially once you hit your 50s, 60s. And again, lots of, lots of natural variations. Not everybody has that experience. What I experienced was that I went from very late to very early. So we're not nocturnal mammals, but side note to those of you who are still here tonight, uh, you can walk down to the uh, bridge and see the little bats. And I put this slide in every time because A, I love bats, and B, look at their little feet, they're so cute. <laughs> but we're not nocturnal mammals, right? But we're doing a job that requires us to be awake overnight. So we always have this sort of social jet lag or circadian asynchrony, and all of us have just experienced it traveling from you know, a coast to a different time zone. Even just an hour's difference can make um, a huge difference in how well you're functioning. Um, so we're going to talk just very, very briefly about the sh short and long-term risks of shift work, what some of those uh, patient safety issues are, and the risk to the healthcare worker. This uh, study comes from uh, a big systematic review looking at a, a lot of different um, processes. And basically you can see, you know, it's a heat map, you can see that with increasing exposure to both the length of the shift the number of shifts um, together, and the amount of time without a break, the chance of having a work-related incident related to fatigue increases. So obviously when you look at this, you can see that there are a number of variables that we could change that would reduce the risk of having an event, but uh, making an error. All right, so I was gonna talk about the effects on our performance with lack of sleep. Um, we are not superhumans, we are just normal humans, and multiple studies have been able to show the importance of sleeping, especially on our motor skill performance. Probably not surprising to most of us. Studies as simple as teaching someone to type a repetitive sequence with your non-dominant hand, and then testing after a certain amount of sleep, show that actually our brain helps to smooth out errors and create a cohesive sequence when you test the next day. Usain Bolt took naps prior to breaking his world records. And in 2015, the International Olympic Committee finally published a consensus statement highlighting the importance and need for sleep across all sports, all genders. And they've had a more recent one also declaring how much physical health and mental health you need sleep to be able to have both of those. And so eight hours of sleep is the ideal amount that everyone speaks to. Less than six hours of sleep, the time to your physical exhaustion, it takes it's just 10 to 30% that you're already getting that more exhausted. And just like any pianist or any other procedural skills, all our performance starts to decline with less sleep. So in a great study of looking at professional athletes, one of the better ways to study this, um, when you get at least eight hours sleeps when they followed one Golden State Warriors performance, you can see all the benefits they started to have. They had increase in the minutes played, increase in points per minute, that's awesome, increase in their three-point percentage they were making, and in the free throws they made. And although we're not professional athletes, I think it's probably pretty easy to imagine how when we are on shift, how we can be similar and how our performance is gonna start to change as well. So again, looking at the Golden State Warrior player, with that less than eight hours sleeps, they had all these increased turnovers, increase in fouls committed. So I think when I try to think about this, 
I like to think, what does that mean as an emergency doctor? Of course, this is me making up numbers, but I think you could imagine we could see more patients per hour if we're more well-rested. We probably can write our notes a little bit better, maybe have more procedures, make a little bit more money for the hospital, get your discharges done faster, versus maybe we're just exhausted and you order that extra imaging because right now that just seems the safe way to do it or get that consultant down here to do some of the extra thinking for us. And then some of the less fun stuff that maybe we're just more dismissive to our own teammates, to those people we're working with, even the patients when we're a little less well rested. Not only is our performance impaired when we don't sleep as well, but our concentration is affected significantly by lack of sleep. I always find this really interesting that every hour someone dies in a traffic accident just to, related to fatigue related error. I feel like growing up we were taught so much about drunk driving and the accidents that occur from that, but it's just as important that we're getting sleep as well. Under the smallest amount of sleep deprivation, our concentration can become impaired. And this is easiest to actually visualize with the driving accidents. And the way and the reason for this is often due to microsleeps. So microsleeps are seconds in duration. It's a momentary lapse in your concentration. Your eyelid may close, may not close. And it's typically really occurs with those that are chronically sleep restricted. So you might be thinking, great, I get at least six hours of sleep a night. I'm not chronic chronically sleep restricted. But unfortunately, I have some ungreat news to share. It's defined as getting less than seven hours of sleep a night on a routine basis to be chronically sleep restricted. Um, so that might burst a lot of our bubbles. And again, you often have no idea that you're having a microsleep even while you're driving because all channels of perception are blocked during a microsleep. And so why this matters is they've studied this and they've been able to show that with those microsleeps, if you go 24 hours of sleep without sleep, so one, one overnighter that you're fully pull, performing, you have incre increased microsleeps by 400%. And then if you, they compare that when you're just sleep deprived to six hours of sleep a night, and it only took 10 days in a row of six hours of sleep to equal a full 24 hour that you had pulled to get that 400% increase of micro sleeps. So probably unsurprising, we're not great at knowing how impaired we truly are. And worst, we actually acclimate to our bad sleep habits, and even if it's just those seven to six hours, and we get used to reduced energy, more exhaustion, impaired concentration, and recovery of sleep even after three nights of poor sleep is just not still getting to that eight hours of sleep performance. And so here are some of the actual numbers of if you get less than five hours, you get in three times the increased risk of crashing, less than four hours, so sometimes when we do that and we drive back from shift, you have 11.5 increased risk of crashing. The shorter you sleep, the shorter your life. It's just as simple as that. Besides our cognitive impairment and our performance, the physiological challenges are profound. And it's really amazing to look at these because I feel like we always talk to patients about these simple things they can do. Stop smoking, it's one of the best things you can do and it'll save your life, it'll change things. Unfortunately, these are all the risks we get when we start to sleep less and sleep fewer than six hours a night. How many people are 45 years or older? Great, so this is the fun statistics that we all have. If you sleep less than six hours a night, 200% increased risk of having a heart attack or a stroke during your lifetime compared to those that get seven hours or eight. Our cells become less responsive to insulin and there's far higher rates of type two diabetes, again, with just the six hours of sleep. And then if you just feel like maybe on those night shifts that you're all of a sudden going on to, you're just a little bit hungrier, even when you bring your healthy snack, you don't want that healthy snack, you are correct. You eat more calories, you eat less well foods for you, and you're less satisfied due to everything that's happening from the endocannabinoids that are stimulating yourself. And then, again, we have a 40% increased risk of cancer just from one night sometimes when they looked at a four hours of sleep. It can really screw with our cells and make them so that when you were to get an injection, if you got your um, COVID vaccine, your cells might be less receptive, unfortunately, if you had slept less in those nights beforehand. 
So the worse quality of sleep or the less sleep we're getting, we're having so many increased risk. So if we can tell our patients they should stop smoking or they should get more sleep, it's important that we think about doing that for ourselves if we really want to make sure we have a long and lively career as well as just a great life. So um, who's heard of the term, the window of circadian low? Nobody? OK. So this is um, what happens when you are, uh, and as I've got on the bottom of the slide there, it's usually between 2 AM and 6 AM. And that's that uh, feeling of impending doom <laughs> that you get when you see another red on the board <laughs> that you have to go and see during a night shift or when you just like know that you, your brain is not working properly. So there's actually two windows of circadian low. Um, one is, this is the deepest one. Uh, the second one is actually in the late afternoon when uh, you know, there's that Snickers commercial that you need the uh, Snickers uh, to get through. And certainly that is a time when you know, increased caffeine or increased uh, sugar and fat can probably um, help you get through that process. We don't have time to go into all of the different types of fatigue, but broadly speaking, there's that, those three main groups, transient um, fatigue, cumulative fatigue, which is particularly what's going to be happening if you're experiencing uh, sleep debt over a long, longer period of time, and then circadian fatigue, which is what happens uh, when you try and stay outside of your um, regular sleep-wake uh, cycle or uh, across multiple time zones. So the next um, page is, uh, this comes again from that FAA document, and this uh, talks about a pilot uh, doing a night shift you can see there on day three. So just uh, sort of put this into your own experience as an emergency physician, and I think it's very telling that we have this data for other industries and not for healthcare given that in healthcare we have hundreds, hundreds of people in hospitals working overnight. So first day one there, you can see that the person uh, slept overnight, they work during the day, they have that afternoon circadian low, and then they go to bed at night. Uh, then they have a little, day two, they have a little nap in the afternoon, and then they stay up all night, and then this is the percent effectiveness, and there's a number of different ways that you can determine um, effectiveness. Um, mostly through psychomotor uh, uh, testing. Um, but you can see that the window of circadian low is particularly profound there. They come off that shift and then they have a, uh, another you know, sleep after a night shift. But then their effectiveness does not get back to baseline until at least 48 hours after that shift. And your individual mileage may vary, right? There are some people who are better at these transitions than other people. And in general, younger people are better than older people at these transitions. But again, a huge amount of variability. And I think the point for medicine, that, and not just emergency medicine, is that we don't know what our individual circadian pattern is. One thing that the other sort of critical industries have done a much better job of is actually describe this process as being a shared responsibility. So that there is an onus on the employer, whether that be an airline, a railway, a mine, uh, whatever, you know, a nuclear power plant, whatever that is, and the employee um, that they manage their fatigue in a shared response. So for example, when airlines are considering the period of uh, duty, they actually consider that the either side of that shift, right, of the flight. It's not just the actual, you know, like when we consider our work period, it's mostly just when your night shift starts to when your night shift finishes, and we don't really take into consideration um, what some of those issues might be. So now we're going to move a little bit more into sort of what the panel um, conversation is. And uh, our first question is how might we protect emergency physicians as we age and experience physiologic challenges and illnesses? And so I put my own photo up there because I am 55 years old and I also had a recent illness and many of those in the room know that I 
had a recent heart attack, which I was not expecting. Um, I guess nobody's ever expecting that. Um, but so how do we protect um, physicians from relatively predictable um, challenges associated with getting older? So for clinicians over 50, anybody have anything that they... So one of the things that we did in our department was we, um, some years ago, had looked at uh, whether or not we wanted physicians who were over 55 to continue to have to do night shifts. And so about 10 years ago, we switched from a model where everybody still had to do night shifts, no matter what, um, which is still very common um, around the country and we switched it to a, a break at 55 that you could opt out of um, doing night shifts. And then in the last 12 months, we actually uh, reduced that further to 50 based on some evidence from Scandinavia mostly. Um, and I have to say that there's very little evidence out there because mostly healthcare does not study um, this uh, directly. But on the basis of uh, the, the chronotype um, slide, and this is another um, study from a hypnograms, which are sleep studies associated with pilots. So this is on a 15-hour flight from the west coast of the United States to Asia. And you can see how the fragmented sleep is less prominent for a younger pilot than it is for an older pilot. And so on the basis of some of this work, we re uh, reduced our night shifts uh, burden uh, to being opt out at age 50. Does anybody else in the panel want to? So uh, for our group, we were told we are not allowed to discriminate based on age. So the way around that is our policy is if you are more than 25 years post-residency, then you can opt out of nights. Um, so that's been very helpful for some of our older faculty. Um, and also we've been trying to incentivize our nocturnists as much as possible because that just helps out everyone. Yeah, I can't emphasize having a nocturnist team. Um, I'm fortunate to work in a place where we have a robust nocturnist team. There's actually a waiting list to be a nocturnist team, which means that the rest of the faculty, um, on average, they work one or two overnight shifts for the rest of the year. And I will also add, um, you know, for department chairs or, um, you know, financial folks who are thinking about how are we possibly going to, um, you know, increase the, the rate for folks who work at night, I think one thing that Ohio State has done that actually does not cost money is that we incentivize our nocturnists by saying that if you work 50% or more of your uh, shifts as nights, then you get into the fixed scheduling pool. So uh, you still have to work the same division of overnight, sh or the same division of holidays and weekends and things like that, but you get to choose when you work. And I think that that high level of autonomy and control really appeals to many people and they opt into it for reasons like facilitating childcare or uh, just you know facilitating their other non-clinical work. Anybody in the audience want to chime in? Kara? Can you find some evidence that shows that this is impactful uh, around age 38? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually think that the answer ultimately is going to be in some, you know, a little bit like the precision medicine, right? It's going to be that we actually, either through wearable devices or individual testing, or something, we'll find out actually when our peak um, alertness and scheduling is, right? And so that then, you know, health systems will hopefully, you know, because, you know, there are some people who aren't very good at five in the morning, you know, like starting at five in the morning. And there are some people who aren't very good at two in the morning. Um, but there are, but we actually have a lot of people, so we can probably cover it all, you know, and there are a lot of different ways that we could be you know, more equitable about how we schedule things based on people's performance rather than just putting people in a slot. Um, and I think, you know, not just for medicine, but, you know, there's a hundred, there's probably five times as many nurses in a hospital overnight as there are physicians, right, or more. Um, so, you know, this is not just for us, this is for everybody working in healthcare. Um, I have heard there are a few groups out there who um, the younger, younger, 
physicians, younger faculty work a higher percentage of the night shifts. And then as you gradually get older, maybe like every five years, that percentage kind of changes. I don't know the data on how effective that is, but it sounds like it could be a good model. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about child uh, bearing and increased caregiving responsibilities. And I'll just note that I, I got this screenshot from iStock where I like searched for uh, images of pregnant healthcare workers or something like that. Anyway, of course, there's no actual pregnant healthcare workers. There are only pregnant patients. And every single woman has, or pregnant person has their arms like just so on their abdomen, which I just think is completely ridiculous. <laughs> It's like it's like code for saying I'm not fat, I'm pregnant, you know. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Does somebody else want to take this? Yeah. Okay, so I'm happy to present I'm happy to present some of the initial data with respect to pregnancy and um, outcomes related to sleep. So uh, this is a little bit of a depressing slide, but bear with us because we do have some proposed solutions. Um, fixed night shifts do have uh, demonstrated increased odds of some adverse outcomes in pregnancy. That includes the risk of preterm delivery and also a risk of miscarriage. Longer hours also have been demonstrated to impact uh, increased risk of miscarriage, preterm delivery, and also small, low birth weight and small for gestational age. And then finally, uh, having rotating shifts has demonstrated an increased odds of preterm delivery, small for gestational age, preeclampsia, and gestational hypertension. So these are relevant in the third trimester. So the bottom line, pregnant people who work rotating shifts fixed night shifts or longer hours have an increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. So I will start with some of the good news and then I will toss it to the panel. Uh, there have been some recommendations for best practices for those who are pregnant uh, in terms of uh, shifts for emergency physicians. Those include opting out of night shifts prior to 12 weeks or greater than 28 weeks of gestation. Why not in the middle, you ask? So there actually is not as robust of evidence demonstrating adverse events and effects in the second trimester. So truly the focus is on the first and the third trimester. There are recommendations for exemptions from mandatory additional hours. So mandatory overtime, which sometimes happens in times of uh, staffing needs, uh, pregnant people should be exempt from those. In the third trimester, prioritizing shifts that are easily cancelable or coverable. A faculty member being off from the ED clinical schedule starting at 36 weeks. This includes uh, employing a coverage or a call system. At my shop, we have folks sort of post their last several weeks of shifts and say, could I have voluntary coverage for these? And we're a very supportive faculty group, so we typically don't have an issue filling that. And then reduced impact options, such as express care or other non-clinical time. So for example, as an associate program director, I do have some non-clinical time. So thinking about front-loading the clinical burden for the last part of pregnancy, and then having the last two or three weeks be expressly clin uh, non-clinical work. So importantly, these recommendations do not supersede physician preference, meaning that whatever that pregnant person wants is the thing that they should have. We don't wanna be paternalistic about it. Um, an example would be that if someone does want to work until 40 weeks of gestation because they want to maximize their uh, parental leave time, then they should be able to do that. And then also, uh, you know, that feeds into my next point, which is considering the impact of these recommendations on that person's parental leave. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to the panel and see what other uh, sort of innovations or um, uh, interventions their respective departments have made for uh, pregnancy. Yeah, for us, it's definitely, uh, we can opt out of nights starting your third trimester, and that's pretty easy to schedule ahead of time. Um, it'd be great, I feel like, if you could swap out of your nights um, in your first trimester as well, but usually the schedule is published long before the mom is ready to announce that she's pregnant. So I definitely think you need a supportive department um, to be able to do that. Um, it was interesting when I was looking up uh, 
parental leave policies for this talk, there's actually only, I think it was like less than 10% of emergency medicine physicians have 12 weeks of more or more of 100% paid leave. 15% of them, uh, of moms and dads, had to work extra shifts before their leave started. And then 10% had to pay back shifts after coming back from leave, which in my mind is like insane. Like you're, you have a newborn at home, <laughs> what is sleep at that point? And then you still have to work more. Um, so that's definitely very rough on childcare, family life, and I feel like on patient safety as well. Um, so there's not much in the literature about best practice guidelines for a good leave policy or like childcare guidelines, um, but whatever you can do to help the new parents coming back to work would be helpful. I will add that Ohio, at Ohio State, we're fortunate enough to have a large faculty group. We're actually upwards of 70 at this point. And so um, it is very important to us that we do not um, sort of reschedule those missed night shifts and redistribute them to another time. Um, because of the size of our faculty group, it's not really a burden that you as an individual would feel. And so that's something that was um, you know, important to us when we were writing our own policies. I know from a resident perspective, um, we would juggle the schedule for those who were preparing to go off on family leave. If they needed a lighter schedule the last two weeks for whatever reason, it was no questions asked. We worked with the, you know, the chief residents, that resident, and whoever was being juggled around. It wasn't a, I don't want to leave my rotation because I want this. It was, how do we best support you? Which was, I think, a great focus to have, especially from a resident perspective. I'll just follow that uh, from residency perspective. Um, one of our chief residents who's now a uh, faculty awesome uh, human being, uh, Dr. June Gordon, uh, published an article at the uh, Annals of Emergency Medicine, the birth of return to work policy for new resident parents in emergency medicine. So it highlights some of the steps that we can do um, in emergency medicine uh, that's specific to, uh, to our specialty. The other thing to think about is um, the period when they do come back, to, when you do come back to work and you might be um, nursing or have needs to pump and do your policies cover that as well because sometimes depending on what shifts you're scheduled for, that can be an extremely challenging piece if you know, you're on a very busy shift and is there someone who can cover you so you can get away. Um, and then also thinking about potentially some policies will um, look at night schedule during that period as well, um, both for moms and dads, um, because we know that might be a time where it could be hard um, for one parent to be alone um, all night while the other one is working. That's a great point. Um, in my shop, we have uh, fixed scheduling on return for parental leave for both uh, birth and non-birth parents uh, for approximately three months after you return from leave. And then with respect to the lactation, so I spearheaded our faculty group for uh, the lactation um, and post-leave policy in our department, and we actually have a reduced RVU target. Uh, so it accounts for approximately 30 minutes of pumping time um, every three hours. And I, I will say that like, I don't think that a lot of people have to um, sort of lean on that reduced RVU. I think that somehow pumping uh, emergency physicians just managed to still continue to be efficient. But it is nice that that is supported and therefore also translates to support from our partners in the group. When you have to go pump, you tell your partner, hey, you know what, can you watch my side for a minute? I tell the residents, um, you know, if, if someone is dying in front of you, grab the person who is physically there. If you need to update me or to ask me a question about dispo, call my phone. Um, one of the things that we decided to do at Davis about the um, people being able to opt out or actually stop working clinically at 36 weeks was it was actually a wellness issue for the rest of the faculty um, because it was not uncommon that people would get put on bed rest, right? At, you know, and so then you have a lot of people being activated for call. And we are fortunate that we do have a telemedicine service now. So, you know, we do actually take people off the clinical ED schedule. We don't make them stop working, so you don't lose your um, time off after the birth, but uh, we do take them off the actual ED schedule from uh, 36 weeks now. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah. 
All right, so one thing that I wanted to talk about was care of our aging population, especially right now being the sandwich generation, you know, from we're going from one end of the spectrum of caring for new parents, and we also have to think of, you know, our, our own parents as well. Uh, I say this especially as someone who has a father with frontotemporal dementia who's in long-term care. Uh, he gets care 24-7. Um, but before we were able to get him into a home, it was quite the juggle between me and my mother arranging our schedules. So not only does a family leave policy need to protect birthing and non-birthing parents, but having that ability to take leave if um, your aging parent has a fall or gets a diagnosis of dementia, um, and having the, the give in the scheduling and having the awareness that that is an available option. Um, so, you know, you have the, the paid family leave that's starting to become a little bit more prevalent, especially in terms of allowing for aging care. Um, you can have some job sharing so that you're sharing the workload so that not everything is your own responsibility. Um, and then some facilities actually have a policy where they help you tee into resources that are available within your community setting so that you're not trying to work and care for your um, loved one as well as finding resources such as a facility that they can go to. Um, and then, you know, when you're thinking about all of these policies as well, when someone's returning from family leave, it's also easy to forget that when you've been gone for 12 weeks, six weeks, however long you've been gone for, it's also sometimes hard to get back into work. So having a little bit of a protection of easing back into work, like the decreased RVU that's allowed for um, pumping or breastfeeding can be really helpful. I'm not sure if anyone else has some ideas of elder care. I think a lot of this is um, learning uh, about the things that we're doing for new parents because I think it eventually will start mirroring, right? Like how can we just take care of our life beyond just working clinically? Uh, because as academic emergency physicians, we're also expected to do research, to do all the other things. And so creating structural things that will allow us to actually prioritize life in addition to the work that we're expected to do, I think it's important. Um, I will pass this now to Ash. Um, Ash, we're gonna tackle this question, how might we um, build a model of shared responsibility for fatigue management uh, in healthcare. Yeah, so now we get to the point where we talk about what we can actually do. Um, we've talked a lot about sleep deprivation throughout this, and the one point we want to really make going into this is that too much sleep deprivation can lead to impaired performance, um, which can include making mistakes or not working at our highest uh, at our highest level, which can lead to a lot of self-blame, increased anxiety, increased depression, which of course then you lie there awake at night and worsening your sleep deprivation. Um, so there are a couple of things that we can do other than just trying to add on more sleep at night that are evidence-based. Um, one of the big issues with going from sleep to wake is our brains are not great at switching between uh, very different states of consciousness. I don't know if any of you have ever woken up from the middle of the two-hour nap wondering if you've time traveled or on a, on a different planet. Um, not great at doing that. So all of the solutions that we're going to talk about here are based on five to 20 minute periods of rest that could be implemented or built into departmental support in some way that are evidence-backed. One of these is something called uh, a caffeine nap. Ooh, calf naps. Yeah. Has and anybody heard of calf naps? Yeah. Oh yeah, everybody's very emergency medicine people. I'm an so, optimist and I've never heard of this. <laughs> For all of us who love caffeine, it's great news. And the basic science behind this is that there is a synergistic effect between naps clearing our brains of adenosine from the same receptors that it competes with for caffeine. And during, that's a lot of science there. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the basic uh, idea. So you take a nap during that 15 to 20 minute period, and that's the key point. It can't go longer than 15 to 20 minutes. And then when you wake up, it's time for the caffeine to distribute throughout the body and sink in and start having its effect with those nice cleaned out receptors. Um, and the important point again is waking up after 15 to 20 minutes and not going into that very confusing sleep that uh, so throws us So you set your off. alarm, Yeah. You, you drink coffee, then you set yeah. your alarm and take a nap? 
Yes, and I will say the studies that show this are based on uh, coffee levels of caffeine rather than something like tea, uh, so maybe look at your caffeine amounts. Um, another thing that is shown by uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman is something called non-sleep uh, non deep rest. And for me, this is really attractive because I'm not great at just sitting down and falling asleep immediately. Um, so the good news is that you actually don't even have to go to sleep. There are five- Sleep is important, yeah. by the way. <laughs> sleep, <laughs> is important. <laughs> sleep is important, sleep is important. But if you can't actually fall asleep during one of those naps, there are, are uh, lots of studies showing improved benefits for hours out just by closing your eyes even for five minutes and having an intentional rest. The second part of that is this non-sleep deep rest. Um, has anyone actually heard of this concept, non-sleep deep rest? Okay. So essentially, it's sort of like a guided meditation, but it differs from meditation in crucial ways. And one of the things that they looked at is uh, how the brain lights up during meditation versus non-sleep deep rest. And whereas meditation requires active focus and can actually stimulate the brain and um, appear as kind of, your brain thinks it's doing work, Non-sleep deep rest is more like a deep body scan that induces a state of relaxation. It has a lot of overlap with the idea behind hypnosis. So there are a lot of YouTube videos. There's an app called Reverie, uh, without the E at the end, that's a different app, Reverie, which will lead you through these instructional non-sleep deep rest exercises. And there are ones as short as three to five minutes or as long as you know, 15 to 20 minutes, where it takes you through this deep body scan and just helps uh, kind of revitalize you. And there's evidence showing that this can actually improve performance and energy levels for hours out after even just this short amount of time. Yeah, so. I think that's very helpful. And so creating spaces, because I can imagine it's very hard to find those like call rooms to, to take a nap, but just understanding that like napping is, it can be a, a, an important tool. And also, like, just understanding that, like, when we work, again, as a nocturnist, like, I, I struggle with this. And, and for me, it became really serious when I got into a car accident last year, right? Because I had a micro sleep. And then I realized, like, if I, I'm, like, a wellness person and I do a lot of self-compassion, if I do all of these things and get into a car accident, I can imagine that many of my faculty and colleagues, the residents, the trainees, who also have micro sleeps and we just don't talk about it. And so we really need the data because there's not a lot of data out there in emergency medicine. Yeah, so turning these microsleeps into more and more deliberate five-minute rests during the day actually can help. And um, I think one of the things I would be curious to hear from you is, you know, as a medical student, my residents I've worked with have been really good about telling me to go and take a 10-minute break. Um, but I've actually never seen one of the residents take one, and I'm wondering how, if you could talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's a study that's led by uh, Dr. Wendy Sun and several other residents across 13 residencies, uh, and, and, and we're working on getting this published. She presented this uh, at, at SAEM. And what we found is one in three residents, um, only one in three residents took a break during their shift, right? One in 10 spent more than 10 minutes actually eating. And that's eating, so not even like just taking a break to rest. And then one in six residents did not even use the bathroom. And I can imagine many of us here can, can, can attest to this. We do this ourselves. Like how many of you actually got to go to the bathroom today because of the many lectures that we've gone to from one session to another? We're not modeling as well, including myself, but I think just calling that out is important for us to just understand that like we have to do better in our environments. So building in things like this helps to kind of build from a top-down level too. We as medical students feel more comfortable taking breaks. Residents feel more comfortable taking breaks. Um, I just got off an anesthesia elective where, uh, no joke, during one moment, we had not one, but not two, not three, but four separate anesthesiology attendings pop in within the same 30-second period to offer the anesthesiology resident a 10-minute break. Um, it was very unusual, but uh, finding ways to kind of really model that from a top-down level so that everyone at every level feels like, feels empowered to take that five to 10 minute break just for their own well-being is really important. And then of course, adding in things like making sure that you can get a food break, making sure that we have, you know, we have water stations all around here, making sure that you can hydrate. All of these things are shown to also increase energy levels. Yeah, I think structurally we can also design things like precision scheduling so that you know that you're not gonna go from an overnight shift a day off and then having them work at like six in the morning. That's just cruel to the body. You've seen the slides that we actually need a little bit more time for recovery, right? 
Um, also understanding that people will have fatigue after an overnight shift. So in, in addition to providing those uh, uh, air call rooms to, to sleep, um, uh, in our residency, this is actually the institution, um, we provide Uber rides for our residents to get home. And not just to get home, but they need to also pick up their car. And so like another ride back to pick up their car when they're safer uh, to pick that up. So these are just a, it's like some ways to, to create like systemic changes as opposed to expecting the individual, right? The people are working really hard already to just do better, right? It's not fair. Uh, we also have the... Uh, rideshare program back and forth um, yeah. to the hospital. One other thing that, oh, sorry, there's a question from the, go ahead. My, my question is, when, when do we start recontextualizing this as an occupational health and safety issue? Right, exactly. That was <laughs> if all of our jobs slowly released poison gas that increased our risk of cancer and differentially affected our older physicians, our pregnant physicians, and our new parents None of us would think I mean, even to the point where, like, I mean, you, you know, many of you probably have offices. Certainly the university will provide you with an office chair, right? Or maybe a computer to work on. And maybe they'll give you an ergonomic wrist splint, right? When has anybody ever said, hey, I'd like to pay for the block out blinds in your house? Nobody, ever, right? You never provided, it's not, even a, it's not even available to you as a discount. We somehow think that these things are like the, completely the responsibility of the healthcare worker and not the responsibility of the employer. I totally agree with you. I really appreciate the sentiment. In our work in Wellbeing 2.0, we have to work with the system as opposed to doing this us versus them. And so at the Wellness Committee, we invite you to, to join us because this is an area that we're really exploring to understand, again, SAM is research and education. There's not a lot of data out there for emergency physicians. And so um, this is one of the priorities that we're really focusing on because, again, like wellness people get into car accidents because they're sleep deprived. I think it also highlights an important difference um, as a former nurse before med school. It was the expectation that I would leave the unit during a 12-hour shift for a 30-minute lunch break and two 15-minute snack breaks. And the expectation was that one of my fellow nurses would cover my patients for while I was gone. But while the time I was gone, my break was set, I was gone. I could go to the break room. I could go to the bathroom. I could walk around the hospital and run up and down the stairs. I could do whatever I wanted, but the expectation was not that I had any responsibility to my patient at that point. So it was a break. And I think it would be um, wonderful for the expectation that we actually take a break to make its way into emergency medicine as well. And part of this is hard because we're trying to advocate for ourselves. And I see Dr. Losak in the audience who's done a lot of work on unionizing. Like we're seeing efforts on this already, right? And eventually, hopefully, we can collectively, as you said, uh, that, that we can advocate for a better change to take care of ourselves because we're just as human as our patients, we're just as human as our medical students and everybody else that would also require those needs of the basic thing of sleeping. So just in the, we've only got, I think we're actually at time, but, um, you know, I would just encourage departments that have not thought about this to think that, you, you know, you should have a strategy for pregnant faculty and residents. You should have a strategy for ageing, uh, mostly faculty, let's be honest, mostly residents aren't that old. All of us will age. I yeah. am clearly getting old. <laughs> um, you should have um, the ability to you know, have people off for an extended period of time for whatever reason, whether that is uh, pregnancy or a heart attack or a, um, you know, broken femur or a mental health disorder. Um, you know, you should have the ability uh, to be a little more flexible in your working strategies. We should be as kind to each other as we try to be to our patients. Um, 
and yeah, thank you for being here. I just want to take this moment to thank Dr. Uh, Tyler for leading this group and also to the amazing panel that we have here. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the Wellness Committee, please join us. Please help us like figure this out because this is a need in our specialty. Thank you.